Good morning. Um, my name is Julia Hynaxius, and it has both been my pleasure to teach with Bob Leverich for uh, two years, my first year at Abergreen. And this year, currently, we're teaching in a program called Multiple Dimensions. Uh, it is also my pleasure to introduce to you the person who will be introducing Bob. Um, Rhodes Hinman has been a student of both mine and Bob's. Um, and uh, Rhodes has been at Evergreen for three years now um, and will be graduating this year. Uh, Rhodes also, uh, just to kind of give a plug for some of the things that uh, we're able to do in the 3D arts and crafts at Evergreen, uh, Rhodes has recently gone through an extensive application process uh, via nomination for something called the Windgate Award. The Windgate Award is um, it's a grant that gives an uh, undergraduate graduating student a $15,000 grant, which they can use to further their craft education. Uh, so we don't know yet if Rhodes has been accepted as a Wingate Scholar, but even the application has been an incredible feat. So if you're interested to talk to Rhodes more about that, um, I'm sure you can find him afterwards, or uh, me or Bob. So everyone welcome Rhodes Hinman to introduce Bob Leverich. Hey everyone. Yeah, just on the Wingate, it's hopefully it's going to be an ongoing thing for Evergreen students. So if you're um, you know, sophomore or junior, it's a pretty cool opportunity. So I've had the privilege to work with Bob extensively in my time at Evergreen. He co-taught the first program I was in, Thinking Through Craft, along with Julia. In Thinking Through Craft, Bob guided the wood section and Julia the metal in a thorough examination of techniques and fabrication of both functional and art objects, and also the parallels that exist between those definitions. We discussed in seminar the hierarchy of craft and art, the balance of machine and handwork, and craft as a tool to enact social change. Although I can't say that we reached any sort of final resolution on these topics, I can say for myself that this was a truly formative experience that shaped the trajectory of my education and significantly changed my perspective. Not needing to find answers, but instead finding more questions has been a defining characteristic of my experience working with Bob. Uh, when I come to him with what I think is a pretty simple question, we usually end up having long and often meandering conversations that lead to lots of notes and ideas for the current project, plus 20 other projects in the future. If there is a problem that needs to be fixed, Bob will grab a roll of tracing paper or tear off a piece of butcher paper and sit down with me or any other student and spend as much time as it takes for things to start to click. I will say that often it doesn't click for me until a few minutes, hours, or days later, but eventually it does. Eventually I reach a point in my design or making process I did not know I even had the desire to get to because of some detail that came up in one of those long conversations that are as much about creating the space to be present as they are about finding the solution to a problem. The beautiful thing about Evergreen, what I believe to be one of its greatest strengths, is that every student deserves and is supposed to be given that space to be heard, to be present, and to express. This does not always happen in lecture halls and class-wide demos. It is something that happens in those small moments, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, where there is actually space for some real dialogue to occur. It also happens in the doing, in the process. During this past summer, I received a surf grant fellowship to assist Bob on his large-scale granite sculpture installation at Vashon High School. The days were made up of dusty, hard work, great conversations, and lots of pizza. There was a cycling crew of five or six students who worked on the project to varying degrees. We would meet up at Vic's for lunch more days than not to talk about the project and just reset with a cold drink and a slice. These times of leisure, as much as the times of work, were an essential part in, the making, in making the experience more than just a job. Those times of camaraderie and fellowship are probably what I will always remember most fondly. Bob has taught me that work is important, but the people you work with and how you engage with them is even more so. Process and technique are both a huge part of Bob's work. Technique is of paramount importance as it is the language with which the concept can be communicated. Technique is also something that can be passed down and shared with other people. One of the greatest gifts Bob has given me is the ability to slow down in my design process and focus on the techniques as a way to facilitate creativity. 
Often this looks like just going through the daily motions of any given craft or art discipline. With dedication to the process of making on a daily basis and a connection to community outside of oneself, it is inevitable that good work will come into existence. It is by these methods of continuous engagement and commitment to finding the joy in the process that Bob has amassed the prolific body of work that he has, bridging the fields of architecture, sculpture, and craft. He told me yesterday that he used to see these pursuits as being disparate, but as time has passed, he sees more and more how they all connect and inform one another. I think the motto that sums up my experience working with Bob and at Evergreen in general could be phrased as, learn broadly, make obsessively, and give freely. And on that note, it's my pleasure to present today Bob Leverage. I wish I could talk that good. <laughs> Thanks, Rhodes. Um, Thanks, everybody, for being here. I am really grateful to be here and grateful for my friends who are here and my colleagues and, uh, and all my students and who have been very accommodating while I've been sweating bullets trying to put this talk together. Because um, as I said to my friend Susan in the audience, I make it a point to talk at Evergreen every 19 years. And I think the last time I addressed anybody in this hall was when was shortly after I was hired so um, uh, so I think um, one thing I've learned here at Evergreen is um, um, through the good graces of the the longhouse is to um, remember where we're at on this piece of ground and to thank all the people who have gone before and who have made it possible for us to be here. So, so um, I want you to hold that thought in mind that um, many people, many peoples have made it possible to be here. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Um, let me see. Um, so I guess I should start here. Um, oh, I just have to put it on. Where am I from? Um, well, uh, I'm from Wisconsin. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. And uh, this is the farm. This is the view from the, the hill on the farm where we all would gather for picnics and camping and hikes and uh, and uh, so home and the idea of landscape have always been um, important to me. I think home is important to everybody it's and we all leave it to a greater or lesser degree and so um, it's something that shaped my work over the years. Um, um, my name is Bob I like it took me a long time to get used to Bob but I decided it's okay because it's a verb. And, um, um, this is where I live now, in this tiny cabin. I kind of, I live the way that everybody on the East Coast thinks everybody on the West Coast lives. Um, I have a wood stove and uh, I'm surrounded by fir trees and, and I have this great view. And I should move out of the place because it's so tiny and drafty, but I can't, I can't give up the view. Um, drawing has always been uh, sort of foundational for me. Uh, uh, and um, to all my activities. And um, drawing the figure has always been um, very important to me. Um, these are some early drawings of mine. Um, a few more. Uh, I like to teach life drawing. Um, uh, Michelangelo said that no one could be an architect who didn't have a clear understanding of the anatomy of the body. And as I, as I get older and in the practice of architecture, I understand that more and more, just in terms of scale and how we, 
every every single element of that we um, design in a building is determined by our own by the scale of our own bodies. Um, um, of late, I guess I've been um, getting looser. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I've been using. This is an, a direction I've been going in my drawing. I guess is more brushwork, um, and uh, um, I've always in, been involved in crafts. When I was in architecture school, I was fortunate to study ceramics, kind of on the side. Um, with Warren McKenzie. Some of you ceramics people may know who Warren McKenzie is, quite a celebrated American potter in, at the University of Minnesota. And, um, and I think about craft as sort of my pocket definition for it is repeated recentering on what's essential in an act. Um, and I think craft applies very, applies very broadly across a lot of disciplines. All disciplines have a craft um, that involves this kind of repeated recentering on what's essential. Um, and for craftspeople, that's part of our daily business. I've worked in a lot of materials, um, a lot of wood, but also um, I've done some fine metal work with, <clears throat> at times, um, this is a pin made with silver and African kingwood. Um, um, I've used craft as kind of a, um, for, f to play around the issues of function. This is a piece called Father Sun Chair, um, which was an important piece for me, sort of a reflection on my relationship with my own father and my sort of woodworking forefathers. Um, there's a bit of the influence of um, the woodworker um, Joe, or Wharton Escherich in this piece. Um, and uh, uh, this is a bench that I made when I was teaching at Penland one year, a bench program called, or class called Benchmarks. Um, uh, here's another one that I made at Penland. I, I was sort of getting tired of Scandinavian modern and wanted to <laughs> wanted to make some big turned forms. Um, maybe it's my Italian roots. Um, I'm also an architect, um, and uh, I think that the kind of architecture I like um, is uh, sets the scene rather than stealing the scene, I guess. Um, and uh, this is a, a small town hall that I did um, when, I was, when I was broke. <laughs> and my dad um, hired me. He was the town chairman. And, and, um, and so the town got a nice little town hall. And uh, I like it because it's a fairly modest building and it's fairly um, in the spirit of uh, rural Wisconsin um, without resorting to concrete block. Um, another project that has been really important for me um, is this project, which is another outwardly pretty modest project. It's a retreat center for the Rochester Zen Center in Rochester, New York, where I lived and went to the School for American Crafts and where I then worked for, uh, well, I lived there about 10 years, I guess. Um, and I started working on this project um, toward the end of my time in Rochester and um, worked on it on and off for 14 years and got to know this Zen community, which is one of the older and larger Zen communities in the country. And <clears throat> when I finally left Rochester, I realized I really liked these people. So I joined the Rochester Zen Center. And I'm, I'm still a member, um, still a grasshopper. Um, and so this building means a lot to me. Oops, sorry. Something happened there. Um, and this is a kind of commons, it was a chair zendo originally. 
um, I'm proud of this truss. It's a, um, a tie rod truss that I designed for the space. And this is the actual Zendo. Um, and this is the um, Canone room. Um, I've also done a lot of residential work. Um, and some of my favorite works are the ones, the houses I've done with my former woodworking professor and mentor, Doug Sigler, down in uh, Penland in North Carolina. Um, many of you in the crafts know about Penland School of Crafts. Um, and I've been going to Penland on and off since 1979. So I have, Doug and I have done about 12 houses together. This one, this one we call Coltrane House. Um, and um, if you ever go to Penland, you can uh, you can rent this house. Um, it uh, it's available by the week, um, and it's uh, it's called Coltrane House because it is perched above the the Tow River near um, near Penland. And, and the uh, railroad tracks ran along the river. And until very recently, there were coal trains, about, I don't know, 20 a day, I think, that ran along this house. Later, we built another little house near it. Um, so of course, we called it the caboose. Um, so the caboose is quite small. <clears throat> but one of the pleasures of working with Doug is that he um, is a great woodworker. And so when I work with them, we have a real nice exchange. And I know that the details that we come up with together are going to be beautifully realized by Doug. This is a bench on the porch. And uh, this is the interior of the, this small um, caboose and uh, with a beautiful kitchen. Kind of, Doug loves, loves to do kitchens and this dovetailed uh, counter joint is kind of a signature of Doug's. Um, this is another view of the house from, it's on quite a steep site also overlooking the Tow River. Um, sculpture. I've been making sculpture for a long time. Um, and I think about sculpture as another pocket definition. Um, Sculpture, is, sculpture, I think of as shaping, shaping the intractable into the ineffable. Taking stuff that's hard to work with and making into something that's hard to forget. Um, carving is really basic to me as a, as a sculptor. I think it's kind of what got me carving, and, or it got me in sculpture. And I think of carving to be sort of like drawing. Um, uh, they're similar. Um, in both carving and drawing, uh, the hand and the mind are moving together over the skin of a thing. Um, and there's this old 19th century notion um, from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts about um, the skin as being the place where the, where the soul meets the world. And I think about that when I'm drawing and when I'm carving. I, in both of them, I feel very intimately involved with sort of the this kind of um, this boundary plane um, between inside and outside, and between uh, between the meaning and the or the or the soul and the and the soul of the piece or the soul of the person. Um, Life drawing, I think, is this really intimate exchange between the person drawing and the person who lets you draw him or her. Um, uh, about carving, Michelangelo said, I, it is well with me only when I have a chisel in my hand. Um, he, I think he might have said something similar about drawing, because he was also a great draftsman. Um, I, speaking of Catholics <laughs> and Catholic artists, um, I used to keep my studio open by doing some work for Catholics, for churches, and 
Um, it's really interesting to do church work because you're working as part of a really long tradition. This is a detail of a, a carved relief, a big five-foot square mahogany relief that I did of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, who was the first American saint and a contemporary of George Washington and the, sort of the, the founder of parochial education in this country. But um, uh, These are early carvings. Um, a torso on the left. I like torsos because for me they're sort of about where the heart is and where the breath is. Um, the figure on the right is called Friday, um, and it was inspired by a poem by Marianne, or by Elizabeth Bishop called Crusoe in England. It's about Crusoe's reflecting on his time on the island, and he's back on another island, namely Great Britain or England. And, um, um, and it ends with a line, um, and Friday, my dear Friday, died 17 years ago this month, or something like that. Um, so in, in part, the poem is about um, leaving one island behind for another, but it's also uh, um, about loss. Um, um, I've done a lot of figures in boats, solitary figures in boats. They kind of represent um, the soul and the body to me. I think we're each given a vessel to sail around in for our lifetime. And um, so I've used this form a number of times. Um, this is my daughter when she was little um, uh, in Rochester. Um, and I made a series of pieces for her as part of a show. It was called 12 Toys for Annie. And um, this one's called Pride. Um, this one's called Courage. Because um, whichever way you set it, it stands up. Um, this one's called called Bunny. It's made out of woven wire mesh that I found at a junkyard. Um, uh, this one's called Crib. And this one is called <clears throat> Come Back to the Farm, Little Elsie. Um, I had a great aunt, Elsie, who moved to California after the war and lived there for, I don't know, 40 years and then came came back to the farm, essentially, to die. Um, this is another piece that I made thinking about her. It's called Rolling Home. As I said earlier, I think about home a lot and about where it is exactly and how, how do I return to it. Um, uh, this is, a, I've, I've done some public pieces um, in wood. Um, this is a piece for the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire. Not a great slide. It's called Confluence. Um, and it was uh, made with wood from a tree that marked the confluence of the Chippewa and Eau Claire rivers in northern Wisconsin, where the, where the college is. And um, they asked for a piece on the wall, but I wanted to lose money faster, so I made a suspended piece. Um, and uh, sometimes you got to pay a lot for education. Um, uh, I carved some stone when I first started making sculpture, but I really kind of returned to it about 10 or 12 year, 10 years ago here. Uh, I taught a program called Written in Stone um, with a poet named Tim Kelly. Um, and, uh, and I kind of returned to working with stone. And usually when I return to a, or start again with a material, I often start figuratively just because I, uh, it's a place that I'm familiar with. And um, so again, these torso forms. Um, and here are some more made from river stones. Um, and again, I, I like them because of this idea of, of breath primarily. And in relation to that, um, this uh, Indian 
idea, I mean, Indian sculpture, uh, Stella Cramrish, who is an art historian who wrote about Indian art, talked about yogic breath and the idea of informing a sculpture from within um, and talks about how that, that is elementary to an understanding of, of Indian sculpture. So you see these figures that look like the Michelin Man if you're looking at them from a, from a uh, Greco-Roman perspective. Greek and Roman sculpture tends to be much more literal and much more attentive to, to the forces of gravity on the body. Um, but when you change your viewpoint and start looking at Indian sculpture as informed by breath, suddenly it all makes a lot more sense. Um, um, house forms, again, um, uh, appear in my work. Um, this one's called uh, Alone Together. Um, um, one of the great things about living in this neck of the woods is that there's lots of granite. Um, and I started carving granite early, I guess, and um, really enjoy it as a medium. Um, uh, this piece is called Traveling Over White Peaks. It's made out of not granite. It's a piece of Turkish serpentine, I believe. Um, uh, this piece is called The Ends of the Road. Um, and uh, these meandering um, lines I've started using, I started using in my work early on, I guess, as representations of roadways or pathways, um, um, generally in stone, but then I have used them in wood also. This is a um, piece called Between You and Me. It's, uh, it's about 21 feet long. Um, and I wanted to see what I could do with um, wood timbers and to take over a space with sort of a minimum of material. Um, and uh, these pieces also kind of uh, come out of um, my interest in, um, but not much knowledge of, um, or not, at least not well-informed knowledge of, um, of landscape paintings, Chinese and Japanese landscape paintings, and scroll paintings in particular, which I think are, um, I love the idea of a scroll as something that you, um, you unroll and roll up at the same time so that you think about it as a, as a, as a metaphor for life. It's sort of rolling up behind you as it rolls out, as you roll it out in front of you, and you're, you're always leaving something behind. In, in drawing, they talk about running perspective in Chinese scrolls, about where you keep moving the vanishing points. <laughs> and um, not, a, not a Western idea. But, um. So several of my friends, including Julia, suggested that I talk about process. Um, and uh, Um, Richard Serra said once, work comes from work. And um, indeed, these stone pieces that I did um, led to me getting uh, um, chosen to take part in the Scudic International Sculpture Symposium in 2014. Uh, in, I guess it was the month of August and a couple weeks in September. Six, so I was in Maine uh, for six or seven weeks and with seven other artists from around the world, and each of us um, made a piece for a different community. And my community was Castine, Maine, um, which is an old, very old settlement. Um, Penobscot Indians, Native Americans first, and then uh, French and English and American. So lots of heritage. It's, it's where Maine Maritime Academy is. Um, and people there talk a lot about um, people who live there um, and people who have gone away. Um, so I came early for a week, and this was my site um, uh, for the piece. Um, and I, I did a lot of drawing. 
and I talked with a lot of people and met, met lots of people in the community who were sort of very suspicious. They were, the city, um, the town board, um, in Maine they're called uh, select men. Um, the select men had decided we're not putting any money toward this project. And a, a, a woman architect in town said, to hell with that, I'm going to raise the money. So she raised, oops, sorry, I keep, hit, keep hitting too many buttons here. Um, she, uh, she raised the money that was required of towns to take part in the Scudic Symposium. Um, and I came up with a concept toward the end of that week of this idea of home and away, um, and talking about people who um, come from away or who have gone away. And then I got busy and working with um, Jesse Salisbury, the guy who, who uh, originated the symposium and has led it numerous times. And we went stone, stone hunting. We went to a lot of granite quarries. And we kind of chose stone that was cast off stone that was not um, uh, as immediately marketable. The stone that oftentimes if it's thinner than like two feet thick, they, they throw it up on the side of the quarry and nobody uses it. Um, they like big thick layers of stone. And I started carving and I, I put this picture in because I got to get really dirty. and. Um, uh, but I also got to work with lots of people. There were 8,000 visitors over the course of the six weeks. Um, so it was very, for a, for a greener, um, it was a great symposium to start with because it was very community-based. And toward the end of, the, of September, the kids went back to school and the kids from Castine and from all the other little towns bust to the site and, um, and we had all these kids hanging out on the site. And, um, and it was great fun to let them handle the tools. And, um, and then there was a big closing ceremony at the end. And then we installed the piece. And, and that catch or that boat belongs to Maine Maritime Academy and um, fortuitously sailed by as I was taking some photographs. Um, just after the piece, pieces were set on their concrete bases. Um, and then all the kids came over from the local grade school and we talked about home. And um, their teachers were surprised because so many of the kids, um, it was an issue for them too. They were like, well, suddenly they were all talking about places they had moved from or had to move from. And, you know, some of them were miffed with their parents that they had had to move. And, um, uh, so home is such a pervasive um, issue for, for us all, I guess. Um, so the piece is about home and away, and, and it points away. It points, these meanders point out toward the um, Penobscot Bay and the Atlantic. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of this piece. They invited me back the next summer for a big dedication ceremony, and it was very New England, and and uh, the uh, symposium organizers told me that I was the only person who had been invited back um, for a dedication like that. And they liked the piece, and it's become this kind of landmark. You know, it's like people walk to the site and with their dogs and strollers, and and they. Uh, I, it's not. It doesn't hurt that it has a great view, um, but if you saw my first sketch of it, people were sitting on it and people sit on it. And, um, and that's really gratifying for me. I was practically um, in tears the day the kids all came over. It was just so wonderful to um, see them interact with the piece. Um, so, so this piece um, has led to more work, speaking of process and um, work comes from work. Um, um, so um, I, in 20, late 2015, 
start of 2016, I, I got asked by the Washington State Arts Commission um, if I wanted to interview to make a piece for Vashon Island High School. And um, so I went and had an interview, and I wanted to kind of walk you through quickly the, the process. Um, there were lots of meetings. Um, so anyway, I started in January of 2016 and just finished the piece, finished installing the piece a couple days after Christmas, um, this past Christmas. Um, this is the site, this uh, kind of triangle of land um, next door to the, the relatively new high school building. Um, here's another view of it. And, um, and I waded into this very um, involved <laughs> process of making a public art piece um, through the auspices of the Washington State Arts Commission. Uh, Marissa Lobsher from the Arts Commission was my, my uh, project coordinator, and there was a committee, and I made presentations of concepts to the committee um, based on, I did a tremendous amount of research about the island and its history and the peoples who had been there in the past, and, um, and I listened to people at the school who said, well, uh, one of the issues we have is getting kids launched off the island. So one of my concepts, this, this one was about the idea of embarkation. And I'm using the same forms to some degree again. This one, this proposal had two sort of stainless steel um, forms, a rudder shape and a sail shape. Um, and it was really helpful that the, that the committee could see the piece that I had done in Maine, and particularly that slide of all the kids piled on it. I think that's what really um, helped me get the job because they wanted a piece that, that the students at Vashon High School could, could really take as their own and, and, and make use of. Um, this was my second concept, which was, um, I called it at the time, the working title was drawing out because the word education, the root word of education is to educe, which means to draw forth or draw out. Um, I had to do um, site plans, conceptual site plans. I had to make sketches of the building in the con or the site of the the sculpture in the context of the building, and then the committee met and deliberated and chose this second concept about um, what I was calling drawing out then. Um, and then I had to do larger scale measured drawings of the of the scheme. Um, and uh, and I had to um, I had to show you'll see here there's a kind of a cross section that shows the footings for the project to hold the stones. Um, it also indicates the that one of the things I proposed was raising the surface of that lawn area to give the sculpture more presence. Um, and I built a model, a massing model of the piece. People ask if those are steps. No, they're not steps. They're just um, indicators of uh, level changes. Um, uh, and uh, they approved the concept. And then at that point, um, my proposal phase of the contract was finished. And then I signed a, a actual commission contract with the with the um, with the state, um, which required me to have a business license, which I didn't have, which required me to have a general contractor's license, which I didn't have, which required me to have a million dollar bond, which I didn't have, um, and uh, what else? Um, I had to file paperwork to to assert that I would pay prevailing wages, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, and then we went boulder hunting. Um, and I looked all over for that central boulder that we were going to split in half and um, ended up finding it at this uh, no longer used gory, uh, gravel quarry east of uh, Covington, uh, so kind of southeast of Seattle. Um, 
And I spent days at this gravel quarry, which is acres and acres of, um, of ground. That th This is the place where a lot of the fill came from to make the first couple runways at um, SeaTac. Um, so whenever they came across a big glacial erratic boulder, they just rolled it to the side, or they put it through their crusher. Um, and after looking at and considering a number of alternatives there, this was the one I finally settled on. Um, uh, in the meantime, um, I picked out these three big stones at Maranaco Stone Company, in, who I worked with pretty extensively in Preston, uh, east of uh, Issaquah. Um, it's a big stone company with big equipment, and they bring down big pieces of um, talus. Talus is the geological term for stone that's been... How am I doing? I'm good? Um, Time-wise. I, I want to make sure I leave time for questions, so I'm, if, I'm trying not to rush, but I'm trying to move along, too. Um, uh, so the problem for me was, when I was in Maine, the stone that I could get for those long pieces was quarried stone. But out here, I quickly learned that nobody quarries granite anymore. Um, there used to be 50 operating granite quarries around Seattle back in the I, I, pre-war, pre-World War II. Um, and lots of building stone was taken out of them, lots of stone for highways and roadways. Um, but now the only operating granite quarry nearby is on uh, is up on um, north of Vancouver. Um, it's called Hardy Island, a little island up there where they quarry granite. <clears throat> and it was going to be quite expensive to bring granite from Hardy Island, um, about twice as much as these stones cost. These are so these are talus, which is which it refers to stone that's basically broken off cliffs or escarpments and has slid, and slid down the mountainsides over centuries. So they already had quite a bit of sculpted form on the sides, if you will. Um, there was a lot to react to in the stones. Um, so my initial sketches and model show sort of flat-sided stones, but um, I adapted, uh, I guess. Um, which is one of the wonderful things about working with stone, um, is that it it puts you in this constant um, position of having to to play with what comes next based on what you got. Um, so we, I picked out these three stones. The longest one on the right is about 13 feet long. Or actually, the one on the left, I think. No, the one on the right is the longest. Um, because uh, I was looking for stones in that in that um, vicinity of length, about 13, 14 feet. Um, and it's hard to find a, a piece of rock that broke off a mountainside that has stayed that long because um, they keep moving and they keep breaking. Um, so Maranacos has a huge diamond saw, um, circular saw, and and we cut the bottoms on the stones so that they would sit flat. That was the first thing we had to do. Um, and that was done up at Maranacos. And then they loaded them on a truck um, and brought them down here to Evergreen. And I arranged with the college and the facilities office to rent back space, outdoor space behind the farthest, the furthest shed at the facilities yard and to work outside there. Um, and so I rented back some space from the college, which was a really good arrangement for all of us because it made it easy for me to work with the students who worked on the project and it was accessible um, to the Evergreen community. I had lots of visitors, which was great. Um, so they brought the three horizontal stones down and unloaded them. And my student, Grant Walker, who worked with me for the summer, um, also, along with Rhodes and Sarah Robinson um, and Michael Ciano and a few other folks. Um, this was in April, and uh, 
and Grant and I started um, working on the tops of a couple of the stones, leveling them out. Um, you can see we're using what are called feathers and wedges here, which is a really ancient splitting technique. Um, the feathers are two steel angles that go in on either side of a hole that you drill, and the wedge goes between them, and as you drive them in, it creates a plane of pressure and, and um, breaks the stone. Um, so we're using feathers and wedges on the top two photos to remove that top chunk of stone. And on the lower one, we were just cutting slices and then driving big steel wedges into, you can see on the left, sort of knock off big pieces of stone, about, that's probably like three inches square and about, I don't know, 24 inches long. Oops. What's going on here? Why is it not moving? It's frozen. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Let's see. So, so we had the horizontal started, then we went back out in the field. I finally made up my mind about the boulder um, <clears throat> after advice from a lot of people, including Ken Tabbitt, um, who is a geologist, and we talked about the makeup of these different boulders that I was looking at and which ones would split the best, were most likely to split the best, and I wanted to stick with granite, so that's ultimately what I did. Um, and we had a field day out in the, in the quarry and we brought generators and feathers and wedges and drills and, we, and a bunch of people came, um, onlookers and uh, friends and uh, students and we drilled holes all the way around this boulder and it split. And uh, it's a pretty amazing process. It takes a couple hours. You drive the feathers and wedges in, and you wait about 15 or 20 minutes. And then you come back and you drive them in again. And they actually do loosen up a little bit. Um, and so after about two hours of doing this every 15 or 20 minutes, you hear this little tinkling sound, and the stone gives way. And it's quite quite miraculous. It goes all the way through. Uh, Mar Maranacos came with the crane and loaded up the two halves and took them to their yard so that they could sob flat bottoms on those. Um, in the meantime, I made templates of all the stones, went back to the school, laid them out on the site so that we could um, locate the foundations for the stone so that the site contractor that I hired could do the excavating pour the foundations, and then regrade around them. Um, back in the yard, we, were, we had flattened the tops of the stones. You can see the meanders are drawn on the tops. Um, and then we started shaping them. And here is Rhodes on the right and Sarah Robinson on the left. They were my two SURF Student Undergraduate Research Fellowship grant recipients who each worked half-time for me for 10 weeks plus some. Um, they both worked really hard. And um, they're holding uh, angle grinders, smaller ones, but we also used these big seven inch angle grinders. And we rigged them up so that we had a water feed on them um, to keep down dust, because um, we were making everybody at the facilities yard <laughs> a little crazy with the dust. Um, so we were underway with that. And then the boulder halves got delivered by Maranacos. And you can see now they have flat bottoms cut on them. Maranacos did that for us. And they also drilled holes in the bottoms of them for pins, so they could be pinned to their foundations. And here's Michael Ciano and Grant Woods. Um, they're, Michael is grinding, uh, and uh, Grant is um, removing frets. This is how we did a lot of the shaping, was with an angle grinder 
uh, with a diamond blade and we cut these parallel lines into the stone and then knock off what, what they, they call it, generally call it fret cutting. Um, uh, and you just keep doing that to take it down to the, to these concave surfaces. Um, we, here you can see the forms starting to appear on the three stones on the tops of them. Um, and about this time I started mapping out the openings on the fronts of the boulders, boulder halves, for the cavities we were going to cut. Um, we had a really busy summer. We had visitors. Uh, the big um, indigenous arts symposium was happening on campus. The guy on the right is Barry Tevatu, who's a Maori sculptor. And then we had three sculptors from Japan who were visiting for a symposium down in Oregon. Um, and my friend Kentaro Kojima on the left had invited them. And so they came to visit and Ida-san, the guy in the center, knew Barry Tevatu from other symposia, so they, they had sort of a homecoming or reunion. And um, we all got to watch the Japanese guys pick up our tools and use them much more effectively than we could, which was cool. We learned a lot from them. Um, and then we started, gou started gouging out the boulder halves, um, again with a water feed on this big uh, a cutoff saw with a 14-inch diamond blade on it. And uh, so... Here are the two boulder halves in process. Um, I did most of the cutting because I had to kind of decide how deep I wanted them. Um, in the meantime, we were all working on the, the other stones, refining the surfaces. Here we're bush hammering the surfaces. Um, bush hammering is a, uses an air hammer and um, a, a chisel with nine um, carbide points on it that sort of pulverizes the surface, creates this kind of um, soft um, soft s surface. Um, and the, the scoop outs are getting deeper. Um, we uh, joked around about calling them uh, adzuki beans. Um, so we called the piece adzuki, adzuki taro. Um, there's a famous sculpture by Isamo Noguchi called Momotaro, Peach Pit Boy. Um, so this is Bean Boy. Um, uh, then we started polishing. Uh, Sira's polishing with a water polisher and diamond pads on the left. And Grant is, um, he's still grinding there. He's not polishing yet inside the boulders. But you can see we rigged up water so that it's spraying inside. Um, Sira took the surfaces up to, what was it, roads like 3,000, 4,000 grit, something like that. So you can see the sheen on the one on the left, it's about finished. Um, so we wrapped up the polishing and, and then the start of October last year, um, Maranacos uh, came down with a crane and we set up all the stones in the yard, in the configuration that they would be at the high school. Um, and uh, then we had a pizza party with, with all the guys from f facilities who um, had viewed us with some degree of skepticism at the start, but really began to um, enjoy coming out and talking to us and, and uh, seeing us every day at lunchtime. And, um, and and they were really helpful, and it was really great to, to be able to include them in the, the mix while we did this project. So Mark Cormandy, who runs the yard there, was really helpful um, all the way along. Um, so now the stones are the shape they're going to be, so I had to make more templates, remake all the templates, um, and, uh, and then the foundations got poured. Um, I did a bunch of detail work on the stones, including uh, the state required that I have a plaque on the piece. So I had to have a plaque made, which gives the name of the piece, which had now become ways of knowing rather than drawing out. 
um, the idea of ways, um, roadways, pathways, seaways, um, the idea of sort of opening this stone and ways of knowing um, moving out from it. Um, the idea of education as I like as drawing out rather than cramming in, sort of. So, and the the school seemed to like that idea as well. So then, um, I looked for um, someone to install it. Um, I was going to work with Maranacos initially, but it was going to be too expensive, and they didn't have a big enough crane. So I finally went with Snell Crane Company <coughs> here in Olympia, and they were going to do it, but then the the train derailment happened, and they had to have one of their cranes stationed um, up at the at the the site, and so we we had to wait. And uh, so we were going to do it the week before Christmas, and we ended up doing it um, two days after Christmas. We they came and we loaded all the stones one day. The next morning, uh, we got on the Vashon ferry before dawn, um, and. Uh, like about, this was about 6.30, I think. Um, and uh, got to the site. Uh, well, this is still back on the yard. I guess that's out of order. Got to the site, um, unloaded the stones. Uh, you can see the school in the background there. Um, and you can see the three horizontals are placed here. And the... Uh, um, the boulder halves are getting placed on their bases. You can see the <clears throat> the stainless steel threaded rod that um, pins each boulder half. The other stones are so low that the and I also had to hire an engineer, by the way, um, who was great to work with. He lives up on the island, um, Steve Kaczynski, and um, and Steve didn't think we needed pins for the horizontal stones because their center of gravities were relatively low centers of gravity. The, the bigger boulder halves, um, the concern in this neck of the woods is earthquakes and the, um, the stones rolling back off the footings. Um, and uh, so, so we, um, there it is, um, and it's all muddy. Um, and it will be muddy until, I hope, soon. Um, the school um, hasn't been very responsive lately. Um, but I, I'm hoping that they're planting grass. Um, this guy isn't working anymore. Um, but there you see the piece in the context of the school. Um, it ain't too far off from what I drew to begin with. So. Um, uh, I hung around after we set them up, and I actually ran into a newspaper person from the Vashon Beachcomber um, who wrote a very um, nice article about the piece, actually, and um, was kind enough to say that she, she said, well, I think you really captured Vashon. Um, so I'm hoping that's the case, and I'm hoping that the piece um, proves to be interactive. Um, five minutes. Okay, good. Because um, I'm done. I'm done with that. And and I want to end by talking about teaching. And because I always think of myself as an architect and a sculptor and a craftsman. And, but um, I am also a teacher. <laughs> um, whether I like it or not, I guess I've been doing it now for quite a while. And and people say, well, what's the relationship between them? Um, and I think Rhodes caught what I said uh, yesterday about um, making space. Um, I've decided that that's how teaching relates for me, is that I, I, I try to make spaces for people to, to um, experience things. Um, just as I think my sculpture and my architecture is profoundly about um, spatial experience and about um, the reason I, I teach with um, in the shops, I think, is because I 
feel like um, making things um, reconnects you with the physicality of being human. And in a world that's increasingly given over to abstractions and where your attention is increasingly drawn away from, um, from, from tangible experiences, um, I think it's good to make things. Um, and I think it teaches you things that um, are, are no less important than what you can use, what, what you can learn from um, reading and writing. Um, and um, so, and, and this environment has made me crazy a lot of the time <laughs> teaching at Evergreen. It's a very labor intensive way to teach. And, and it's kind of constantly under assault. It's under assault right now um, as our enrollment drops. Um, we're going to have to make adjustments in the next couple of years, and they and this this way of teaching that Rhodes was talking about and that I'm talking about, um, this kind of direct engagement is um, at risk of becoming a rarity, I think. Um, but but you guys do good work. <laughs> You know, it's just, I'm just looking through all my slides the last few days, my images, and just looking at all the great students I've had and all the collaborative work that we've done together. Um, and most of the work I, I just make a space for. And, um, and I have great help. I have people in... Uh, I have staff people who prop me up in front of the classroom every day, um, and uh, and I have great students that um, um, do all kinds of amazing work, um, lots of 3D work, um, lots of functional work, lots of sculptural work, um, 2D work. Um, uh, Unexpected things. This is um, a student, Elliot, who who did a whole contract on tent building, and then went off to. I don't know if he's working for a tent company or if he's making his own. Um, uh, um, sculpture, craft, um, sustainable design, um, and uh, so. Um, and I guess we're at this. We're at the midwinter slump. We're we're pulling out of the midwinter slump right now. I think, in multiple dimensions, which is kind of wonderful to watch in year-long programs to see students start out um, fresh and happy in the fall, and by midwinter they're really kind of ticked off with the faculty, and it's like dark. And why isn't this? working better and we're not getting what we wanted and then then it kind of swings up and like in, in our shop right now um, I don't know how you guys feel about it but I, I've seen I, I think things have changed suddenly suddenly it's a woodworking studio and people are taking on the tools with much more comfort and um, assurance than they were um, 10 weeks ago and and it's really fun to watch um, so I'm grateful for that um, I'm grateful for my teachers. This is my friend Doug Sigler in North Carolina, also my mentor. Um, and I'm very conscious of what I'm passing on through people like Doug to people like you. And um, so, um, so I want to conclude... Um, I really like poetry, so I brought you a poem. Um, it's by Steve Coet. Um, it's called Notice. This evening, the sturdy Levi's I wore every day for over a year, and which seemed to the end in perfect condition, suddenly tore. How or why, I don't know. But there it is, a big rip at the crotch. A month ago, my friend Nick walked off a racquetball court, showered, got into his street clothes, and halfway home, collapsed and died. 
Take heed, you who hear this, and drop to your knees now and again like the poet Christopher Smart, and kiss the earth, and be joyful, and make much of your time, and be kindly to everyone, even to those who do not deserve it. For although you may not believe it will happen, you too will one day be gone. I, whose Levi's ripped at the crotch for no reason, assure you that such is the case. Pass it on. Thanks. I must remind you to use the microphone for questions. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was asked, how much money did I make on the sculpture project? Um, I don't know yet. I'm still doing the books. Um, uh, I did not get rich. Um, the the budget for the project for me, and out of which I have to pay everything, um, uh, including my accountant and my engineer and the site contractor and the stone and the haulers and the crane work, um, was $97,000. And the stone was probably about $20,000. The stone cutting and so on was maybe another six or eight thousand. The site work was ten thousand. The the installation was about fourteen thousand. Um, what am I up to now? Um, <laughs> um, um, salaries I paid out, uh, rent I paid out. Um, so yeah, I'm still kind of figuring it out because I'm still I, there's a tremendous amount of paperwork for the state um, that I have to do to get my last payments. Um, so, and I've had to hire a new accountant. <laughs> so it goes. Um, it's been uh, it's been a real um, real learning experience to do this project in in many ways. Um, also very rewarding. Um, Is there a microphone over there? Oh. Oh. Yeah, they want you to do your thing. Since you brought up that touchy subject of money, um, how did you even calculate? I did the state want a itemized budget in yeah proposal. yeah I didn't mention that but that was that that took a lot of time actually um, Janet Janice you've probably done it yourself um, the state requires a an itemized very detailed budget before you sign a contract with them you have to you have to you have to argue that it's all going to balance out um, and before they'll sign the commission contract so that took several months of work in itself, just um, researching all the sources and the equipment and the uh, the dis the um, what do you call them the stuff that you're going to use up making a job. Um, so uh, so I became much better with Excel spreadsheets <laughs> um, and. Uh, So that leads to another question. Um, do you, because you have such a broad experience with working with heavy objects like that, 
um, how do you, or do you have a formula for what I call the fickle factor? Like, I don't know why I call it that, but it's that amount of money more than what you ever would have dreamt that thing would have cost. And do you fa how do you factor that into your budget um, as far as, you know, you know that this is about the cost of something, but given all the bizarre things that can happen, it will probably be X percent more. Yeah. Um, usually when, and you probably know this too, when you, when you budget architectural jobs or when you budget construction jobs or, or a job like this, there, there's a contingency. Um, my contingency, since contingency figure in the budget was pretty small. I think it was only about 5%. And I probably exceeded it. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, I shared the budget and all the all the proposal documents with my surf students at the at the start of the summer because because um, I thought it was important for them to see the amount of groundwork that has to be laid for a project like this. Um, it sounds great, you know. Oh, I got a big state commission. It's um, and then you quickly realize. Um, what you're in for, but but also, it was over two years, so there's a lot of time to work it all out. Um, it, it 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 requires a it's akin to architecture, I guess, in that um, you have to have a a clear and strong vision of what what it is you want to make, but with some flexibility in it at the same time. Um, so. Regarding the Vashon piece, uh, public art projects can be very controversial, especially abstract rather than non-representational. Did you have any interactions with the community or the teachers or the students? Uh, what were your interactions like with uh, the folks who saw the art? Um, I haven't heard a lot yet. I, I, I just hear this. I, I think it's funny because the, the people at, in Maine were so engaged with the process. And did have really strong feelings, and there was a community committee that wanted to meet with me to talk about the values of the community that they wanted me to reflect in the work. And um, Vashon has been much more hands-off, and I'm not sure if it's because the um, because the school um, is not actually paying for the work; it's the Washington State Arts Commission that pays for the work and it, it the piece becomes a part of the state's art collection so that the school is kind of a steward of the piece I mean they're interested in it and um, and you know there was this committee process that sort of approved the concept um, uh, I I aim in my pieces I think um, to make forms that are elusive, um, that um, have a kind of elusive power to them that um, is akin to poetry. Um, I think good poetry is economical in that way, and um, but but provides enough um, openness that people can bring their own readings to the piece. Um, who else did I get feedback from? We got lots of feedback from the guys in the yard when we were making the piece. What's this all about? You know, what, you know. And um, again, it's sort of about making space. That's that's my thing. I'm not. I this piece isn't overtly political, or it, it's not. It doesn't make a statement about any issues in particular. Um, uh, I certainly studied the history of the island pretty extensively, and there's there's a fair amount of tragic history there with with the native populations that lived there, with Chinese and Filipino and um, and particularly the Japanese community. That there's a really um, tragic story about um, uh, um, a young man who was. Um, going to be the valedictorian in March of 1942. 
and by May or April or May, he he and his family were sent to the camps. Um, Daigo Togami was his name. Um, and I did some research on him, and, and um, as far as we know, he didn't. He never returned to the island. He'd be well into his 80s or 90s now. Um, uh, I don't feel comfortable trying to borrow motifs or uh, imagery from those cultures that were there before, but I, I certainly think about it a lot. Um, and see the piece as a place, perhaps, to think about it. And I hope in the dedication that um, to invite people from those groups um, to be there. Um, yes? When you start on a large piece, to the blank page? <laughs> um, well, I've been thinking about that a lot as I as I prepare this lecture because I um, I have spent days kind of just doing looking through all my all the sources that I usually go to words and people and poets and artists and 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 then looking at all the images that I've collected of my work of students' work um, and uh, and so there's this. Usually at the start of a project for me, there's this kind of mad collecting phase that's very crazy making, you know, and I don't eat right. I eat a lot of junk food and I, um, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like putting off the moment um, until, until I have to do something. So in this case, I had to put the slides together and say something. Um, and I kept getting down on myself, well, I should... Right. I should type it all out like Rhodes did, <laughs> and I didn't. Um, uh, and, but for me, um, that the white page is, it's like coming home, you know? It's like when you can, when you've got all that stuff, you can collect it and you can set it aside and you roll out the paper and with a pencil, and a, if I can clear the tabletop. Um, that for me is, where everything starts, and I really like that part when I'm just sitting down and um, I'm I'm not trying to oversimplify it. I, I know the idea has to arise from somewhere. For me, I think um, work comes from work. Like Sarah said, it's like the the these past themes that I've been exploring um, clearly inform this work, and I'll be working on variants of them in the future, I'm sure. Um, this meander I, form that I like to use, I think I'll probably use again. Um, and other themes, the, the torso theme and the, um, oh, uh, I'm really tired, I can't think of, there are other ones, <laughs> but, um, uh, it's it's comforting when you when you've been doing it for a while and you realize you're going to keep doing it. You know, I think sometimes when you're young, I remember being in my 20s and thinking, what if this doesn't stick? You know, what if I really am supposed to be a dental hygienist or um, or an accountant or something? You know, but I don't. There might be long periods when I'm I'm not drawing or I'm not making, but I don't worry anymore about whether I'll go back to it, you know, because I don't have any talent for dental hygiene. Or, well, my hygiene's okay, but I mean, for taking, taking care of other people's teeth, that's just not, not gonna happen. Um, so, yes? Um, hmm. I don't know, that's why I make the work, I think, because I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, when I made the piece, piece in Maine called Home and Away, everybody, um, 
people would come up to the site, visitors, and would be like, well, that's a cool idea. Where'd you get that? And I'm, I'm sort of, well, actually, it's really not about, <laughs> well, it is about Castine and about the people there. But in, in, in some ways, you know, as Picasso said, all, all art is self-portraiture. And it's, the piece is a, a picture of me um, in some ways um, on these paths um, moving through my life um, trying to find home, trying to find, um, or homes. Um, and again, sort of thinking about this lecture, I've been thinking about places I've been, places I've lived, and, um, and how sometimes you can resist home at the same time as you are home. You know, it's like, um, I think part of me is, an, is obtuse enough um, to sort of, resist being an Olympian or resist being at Evergreen. But but at the same time, this is where I am and, and I realize how rich it's been. Um, and uh, I don't know I'm, if I'm answering the question. Um, I was thinking about, that was he soon asking that question, because um, we taught together last year and we talked about briefly in the book you had us read about inter-narrative identities, about the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, who talks about narrative identity and how, um, uh, and Oliver Sacks says something about um, all memory is narrative memory. Um, it's all about the story uh, and the whole idea of, our, uh, who is it? Um, uh, Claude Levi Strauss talks about how we think in binaries and how um, uh, this idea of self and other and how um, it's the root of all our stories. All our myths are about the other and we, we don't, we're all, we are the other, you know, within ourselves as well as between ourselves. Um, and uh, so, getting back to recur in this idea of narrative identity, I think. Um, um, that's, that, that leaving home is, 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 is who I am. It's part of my story, I think. Because um, I grew up on a, on a farm with a very landed group of people who, and, and I remember stories as I was a kid um, of my elders talking about the ones who stayed and the ones who went away, you know. Well, so and so is out in California living the good life, and so and so is in Washington D.C. being a lobbyist and wearing clothes that are too expensive. And um, there was a lot of judgment associated with 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 going away, with leaving home. And many of you have probably experienced that. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's so that there are lots of. Lots of puzzles around home for me, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Bob, could you tell us a little bit about what you're looking forward to and has, um, doing, has doing this monumental work given you a taste for that or, or what's coming for you? Um, I think Rhodes and Michael and others would probably agree that it's pretty thrilling to work on those big stones. Um, they, they just have a presence to them. Um, and, and I'd love to do more. It's, it's you know, it's, it, it's a big investment to work at that scale. I still have a few large pieces of stone from the project that um, I'd like to work with this summer. And I don't have a commission in mind. Um, and there are some other themes that I want to explore. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to continue working with Stone, I think. Um, yeah. Noguchi said, Stone is an old man's material. <laughs> So, I'm moving into it. Um, Hi. 
Uh, you mentioned how right now at our school we're kind of facing changes with the classes and programs that offer making like your programs do. Um, I think particularly like evening classes. Um, is there something that you would like to see from us as like the community of students to help support retention of those programs or asking for them? Um, invite lots of people to come and go to school here. <laughs> um, and tell them what we do. Um, I mean, that's our, our issue right now is um, enrollment. Um, and unlike University of Washington or some other schools that have huge endowments, uh, Evergreen doesn't have those kind of resources to tide us over in, in times like this when, when enrollment has fallen. It's kind of ironic that you know, enrollment or employment is pretty good in the country, but um, not at Evergreen <laughs> because of the, the enrollment decline. And, um, it's um, it's going to be a challenge. It's um, and I guess um, working with reduced resources, um, but that's. I used to have a boss, an architect boss, who would walk past me and say. Budgets are like gravity. You can't ignore them. And, uh, and, and he used to say, you have to measure your effort to the fee. Um, and, uh, because I would always try to overdo it. You know, I would do t way too many drawings in the office or whatever. And he was like, you know, we're not getting paid for that. And uh, um, perhaps that says something about me, is that I... Um, I don't know when to quit. <laughs> um, I'm too interested in in making things um, to to put um, to put the brakes on because of money necessarily. I, I have a friend who says, "Well, I would never make anything that I didn't that I didn't know was I was going to get paid for that wasn't going to be in a show or something." And I'm. Um, and I'm sort of like, really? <laughs> Don't you just want to see it? Don't you want to know what it's going to be? And um, we were talking about that in seminar this morning about um, motivations in the studio and um, fretting over whether it's art or not or, um, or it's monetary value. or um, It's like I said about carving. At that very fundamental level of addressing the surface of things, um, I'm I'm not thinking very analytically about it or verbally. I'm 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 someplace else, um, and I think it's a really important place to be. And that's why I like teaching in 3D and in the studios because I think students discover that too. They discover that this is a way of knowing and knowing in the world that is not is not um, it's not solely verbal. Um, it's this deep kind of kinesthetic knowing, and which is not to say that it's stupid. It's a kind of reasoning as well, right? It's um, um, you reason with your body. You don't just reason with your mind. Um, and and I think that lesson starts to come through for our students in the in the three D area. Um, and as I said, I think in a world given over to abstractions and um, digital media, that 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 kind of grasp on your physicality is is still still important. Um, and I think it's key to stewardship as well. I think um, having taught in sustainable design, I think that that kind of deeper understanding of materials by um, actually wrestling with them, not thinking of them just as facts and figures, um, um, fosters a kind of stewardship, a kind of knowing um, that's fundamental to, to that stewardship.
So. Many of you know that already, I think, and I've felt that in what you do. So. Thank you. Thank you for coming.